Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, what a fantastic turnout. Uh, thanks for making it. Uh, this presentation is about OpenStack and Ceph uh, yet again. Six months have passed since Hong Kong, and well, uh, apparently I still have something to say, so that's good for everyone. Um, so let's, let's get into it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sebastian and I work for Innovans. We are a cloud company. Uh, my, my role at Innovans is uh, being a cloud architect, so I mainly build design, uh, build design and well, maintain cloud platforms too. Uh, my daily activities are mainly focused on both OpenStack, Ceph, and uh, also on performance aspect of um, both of them. Uh, apart from this, I devote a third part of my time to, to blogging. So uh, these are the, my personal blog and company blog, so don't hesitate to, um, to check them out. We have a really good, um, really nice content. Um, my, my assumption for this talk is that you are um, kind of already familiar with both OpenStack and Ceph. Um, but just to let you know, Ceph is a unified, distributed, massively scalable open source storage solution that allows you to uh, access, store, and consume your data through several ways, such as uh, object, blocks, and file system. So, well, for this presentation, even if you're not familiar with Ceph, this is basically the only thing that you have to be aware of. Uh, I'll do the rest during the presentation. Well, <laughs> this presentation is about the state of the integration of Ceph into OpenStack, so, well, I prefer to start with some kind of a bad news. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, um, during the, the Havana cycle, we introduced a new driver to store virtual machine disks, um, because by default, when you boot VM, uh, the, the, the root disk of this VM ends up being a file on the file system. So there are several mechanisms inside Nova to change this behavior. So the first one is a file, the second one is, uh, was LVM, so you can directly expose an LVM block to a virtual machine. And then during the Havana, Havana cycle, we introduced a driver for RBD. So basically, you can seamlessly boot a virtual machine within Ceph. The drawback of this implementation was that we were still using the old-fashioned way to boot a VM, which is you have to, you have to take the VM from Glance, uh, which well, in this case is uh, part of um, Ceph. So Ceph is a backend for Glance. So you have to pull the image from Ceph, stream it through the compute node, store it into Volib Nova instances underscore base, and then you have to re-import it into Ceph. So that's, uh, that's extremely inefficient. That makes the whole, process, the, the whole pro booting process really slow. And uh, this is why we ended up with uh, another, another mechanism that is that that we are already using uh, with Cinder, for example, when you want to create a volume from an image. If the image is already stored in Glance, um, by default, when you upload an image into Glance and where the backing store is Ceph, this image is being snapshot and protected. So now when you want to create a volume from an image, what we do is we simply do a copy on write clone. Uh, this is extremely fast and, well, we, we can save a lot of space from this. We tried in Havana to uh, get this code, uh, but we, well, we failed, basically. And yet again, unfortunately, uh, during the ISA cycle, we, we didn't make it in time. Uh, the, the, the code went through feature freeze, but uh, ended up being rejected because of a really tiny bug. So fortunately, Dimitri has um, a branch for this. So if you take the branch, take the last comments, uh, you can apply all the patches, and you'll get the copy on write cloning working when you boot a virtual machine. There are packages already available for this. Uh, we tested them, well, well proven, so you can easily go into production with these packages. Uh, we, um, this implementation is, um, uh, has a, is using a really, really uh, tiny portion of the uh, Nova code, so it's not a big change for the entire Nova, so no worries. Um, so if you're not using uh, Withy Precise or Trusty, you have to go through this uh, external repository. So then what's really new uh, in IceHouse? Well, not that much in mainstream, but um, during the, uh, well, this cycle, we, we had a, 
kind of an issue while uh, using ephemeral images or creating a, vo uh, a volume from an image. Let's say you want to achieve a boot from volume. Uh, we clone the image, uh, but if the image doesn't have a, uh, a raw format, then you will end up with something like uh, can't, boot any, can't find any device to boot the virtual machine. Uh, it's just because uh, Ceph doesn't support uh, QCAL2. Ceph already has his own implementation of sparseness, uh, sparseness of the images. So um, basically, you always need to upload a raw, Im a raw images into Glens so you can take advantage of the copy and write cloning. It was well, somehow a problem because from a public cloud perspective, you can't really force all of your users to, to upload raw images. So we had to find a workaround for this. So now, when you want, either when you want to use the ephemeral backend or create a volume from an image, you, what we do is we, if we detect that the image is not into a raw format, then we on the fly, well, convert it. It's not really on the fly because we, we have to download the image and then re-import it. Um, so this is why for uh, private cloud usage, uh, I'll recommend to always, always uh, upload raw raw format images. Otherwise, you, you, can't really, you can't really benefit from the copy on white clones. Uh, basically, uh, if, you always, if you always import QCOW2 images, then we, we have to create a new image from this, and it's just a flat volume. So that's really inefficient in terms of, uh, of space. Another, another addition that, um, that, that, that came with the, uh, with the ISAS release is the ability to use a specific user uh, to, to control uh, Nova, well, to access the, the, um, the Ceph storage. So you have a specific write-limited user that has only access to a specific pool, and then all of the images will be stored in this pool. So just from a security perspective, this is, um, this is quite a good thing. Unify all the things. Um, we, uh, I had I previously had this uh, this picture when I gave my presentation in Hong Kong. Um, it's just to you uh, like for you like a, a little reminder that um, we have been doing a continuous effort to integrate Ceph into OpenStack since the very beginning. So as you can see, uh, it was already there in Diablo. Then came with SX for Cinder. Well, actually, it was already available with the old Nova volume. And then, as mentioned earlier, we, we made this work for, for Nova during Havana. And now I'm really happy to say that we finally closed the loop uh, because now we implemented this uh, at the Swift level. So I'll get into this uh, into a second for more details. But the cool thing is that uh, I've been waiting so much for this feature. Uh, you have, now you can have this unified storage layer for the objects, for the block, and you only have basically one technology to maintain. So that's, for me, that's incredible. Now getting into Swift. Um, Swift has a well, multi-backend engine functionality. By default, as most of the object storage system, it stores all the objects as, the, as a file on the file system using XFS or whatever. Uh, but thanks to the Gluster guys that led the initiative to uh, push a new, well, this multi-engine functionality they, that they call disk file, uh, we were able to plug a Rados backend. So quickly, Rados is the object store for, for Ceph. And uh, well, that's, that's basically how we implemented it. Um, you won't, if you download the latest version of Swift, you won't find this piece of code. Just because the Swift guys want to enhance and enforce the, the API support, and they just um, they just say that uh, if you want to add an extra backend, it has to live outside the, the main Swift repository. So just like GlusterFS, if you want to get this code, you have to grab it from uh, from Stackforge. But then, how does it work? It's fairly simple. Um, we haven't done any modification at the Swift proxy or everything is operating at the uh, ob Swift object server level. So, well, basically, it's just a multi-engine that is plugged um, on the Swift object server. So you can still take advantage of every Swift, func uh, every Swift functionality, such as middlewares, uh, API support. If your application is already Swift compliant, then, well, you won't notice anything. 
the main difference is the main difference here is that uh, the way to store the object has changed, obviously. So you have to configure Swift with a single replica because you will let Ceph handling handling the replication in the background. Some of the pros and cons uh, about this implementation. Um, Obviously, if you not everyone start starts with uh, an object server, uh, an object need uh, actually. So uh, you might have a, a production uh, OpenStack cluster with um, with objects uh, with with blocks. Sorry. Um, so you might have a already an up and running Ceph cluster that act as a backend for Glens, for Cinder, for Nova, and then well, all of a sudden you have a new application coming, and then well, you have to you need a Swift. For that, so you can reuse your existing cluster, which is well, kind of kind of a good thing. Uh, in terms of distribution, distribution support and velocity, um, the guys from Ubuntu with Trusty made a really nice job um, to integrate Ceph uh, into Cloud Archive. So basically, the latest version of Swift uh, of Ceph, sorry, that came out last week, uh, Firefly, the LTS version, um, is part of Trusty and will be maintained. So. Uh, you just benefit from the Ubuntu CI, all the tests and everything. So sometimes some operators, they just don't want to add external repositories. And then in this case, that's a, that's a really good thing for them. Uh, of course, uh, you must, well, you definitely want to use the Erasure coding from Ceph that came with the latest release. So if you want to build an API REST uh, object server uh, with Swift, you connect it to Ceph, and then you use your area recording um, pool, so you have a really big compression of your, all of your data. At some point, you might want to have an, object, an atomic object store. So pros and cons, once again, for me, it's a kind of a, a, good, a pretty good advantage to have an atomic object store. It's not, you don't always use uh, object stores uh, for archiving. So, uh, and even if you do, you might want to be sure that all of your data are well written and consistent as well. Um, obviously, you only have a single storage layer to maintain, and then you don't have to hire Swift engineers and Ceph engineers. If you have a pretty good uh, Ceph team already, then you don't need to hire any other engineers for that. So that's a, that's a good point as well and a single technology to maintain. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention about Ceph is Crush. Um, Crush is definitely what makes Ceph so unique. Uh, Crush stands for Controlled Replication Under Scalable Hashing. It's just a deterministic algorithm that, uh, that decides where all the objects should be stored. So we don't do any lookup on hashing tables. Uh, everything is done by calculations. So this is first extremely efficient, and you can always retrieve the location of an object, even if the cluster is moving. Uh, Crush is also topology aware. So basically, even if you already have a Ceph cluster running, but you have object needs, uh, you can buy new hardware, but integrate it into your current Ceph cluster. So, and you just tell Swift, you just tell Crush, OK, I have this pool, this set of hardware that have uh, really high density, really a lot of disks, a lot of space, and then I have an SSD, uh, I have SSD machines for, for Cinder, so you can say that's going to be for Swift, that's going to be for, uh, for Cinder. Some, well, maybe disadvantages, of course you need to know Ceph, and performance, uh, but I'll get in, into the, the performance and some of the benchmark that I run into a second. About the state of the implementation of this new backend, uh, I'm quite happy to say that we have 100% coverage for functional tests and unit tests. Uh, I've been playing with this feature for uh, several weeks now, and um, for me, it looks like really production ready, so we are just about to start some pilots with some customers, and well, um, so I would uh, put this into production. We, we identified several use cases for this. Um, if you only have one location, one data center, you you just need to <laughs> you have your Ceph cluster, you have your Swift entity, and then you just need to configure Swift with a single replica, and you just need to configure Ceph with n replicas. So in this situation, you let Ceph handling the replication. Second use case we identified is that you have several locations, like real geo replication, one cluster in the US, one cluster in Europe, one cluster in Asia. Uh, in this case, the configuration is a little bit different. Uh, you just use the Swift geo-replication capabilities for this. So you configure Swift with 
three replicas in this case. And then you have standalone clusters um, in each region, and they are configured with either one or two replicas. Uh, would be more efficient to have two, of course, so you don't have to fetch an object if, uh, if one node goes down. Um, another use case that we, we identified is that you might have an existing Swift cluster, but you don't have any compute now, and you, just, you really want to use Ceph because you made the good decision. You want to use Ceph for your block, for OpenStack, and, well, you really want to migrate everything. So you can basically start by, by tweaking all of the Swift object servers and connect them to your Ceph cluster, and then play a little bit with the ring, and then we'll balance everything. So that's, uh, that's one of the use cases that we have. A little reminder before we dive into performance considerations. Uh, you might be aware that Swift is eventually consistent. So, well, uh, basically it's not atomic. Um, and one storage solution is atomic. Ceph is atomic. Ceph is synchronous. Uh, and the other is not. Um, the right method that they use, and this is why one is um, not atomic, is that Swift is using buffered IOs. Uh, it's just like a really common operation when you write on your Linux machine. Uh, when you do an I.O., it goes through the page cache, which is basically the memory, and then it gets flushed uh, by the kernel later on. With Ceph, they use odirect. For the sake of simplicity, I'll say that they use odirect, but it's a little bit much complex than that, more complex than that. Um, I'll say that they use odirect. So basically, they just bypass the page cache, and they directly write into the disk. Um, a little bit about the object placement. Swift does uh, all of the placement thanks to the, well, a hash algorithm uh, also. And they use the, the proxy for that. So all the, the proxy just routes all of the IO requests to all of the Swift, ob Swift object servers. In Ceph, the design is quite a bit different because that's the client that decides where they will put and store all of the objects. It's just because they locally have they locally have the crush algorithm, and that, and crush once again is responsible for that. About the acknowledgement, uh, if you start with three replicas, Swift will uh, wait for two replicas to be written to say, "Hey, okay, I'm done and I'm good." Uh, otherwise, Ceph will wait for all of the replicas to be written to consider uh, the operation, the IO operation, as done. Um, this is the platform that I used to play with this implementation and to run some benchmarks. Uh, so I had one Swift proxy and one Ceph monitor. And then on the back end, I had five, five uh, burn all machines uh, with six OSDs each. Uh, and OSD, the OSD is the uh, object storage daemon. So it's just responsible for storing and replicating all of the data. Uh, I had a total of 30 OSDs. And um, well, when I, we used uh, Swift Bench for that, so the, the main problem was the, the, the Swift proxy was the bottleneck in this situation. So we weren't, well, we weren't able to, to get all the platform capabilities from this benchmark. And even by replacing one object server uh, with a Swift proxy and adding a load balancer, we weren't able to saturate also the storage side. So we were kind of kind of stuck between 400 and 500 uh, puts per second. Um, and well, that was a little bit frustrating for us. So we, we ended up with um, another benchmarking tool. Um, so we, were, we, we wanted to, to ensure that we didn't introduce, uh, introduce any latency and any overhead by, by implemented RADOS for, uh, for backing all of the objects. So basically what we did is, um, we took one Swift object server and we assigned it one disk, one replica. We did the same for Ceph. So we had also a Swift object server that talks to Rados on the same machine with one monitor, one OSD, one replica. And then we started to directly inject requests into these two processes, so, uh, separately, of course. Uh, and this is what we got. First of all, of course, we measured uh, the performance of the, na of the native performance of the disk. So we got 471 uh, IOPS per second for 4K writes. With Ceph, we, we had almost, let's say, 300. Um, 
for Swift default, we had almost three times uh, the Ceph number. But once again, as mentioned earlier, it's kind of obvious that you would get more performance by using the Swift local storage than the Ceph because it's using a direct. So obviously writing into the memory, it's always faster than writing into an, uh, an hard drive disk. But once again, to ensure that we didn't introduce any overhead, we just wanted to make Swift behaving just like Ceph. So what we did is we just modified the code from Swift and just used odirect for all the operations. Then what we got is almost the exact same number that we had with, with, with Ceph. So yes, this will be slower if you use Ceph for storing all of your objects. But in the meantime, well, it's kind of a consensus. You, uh, if you want synchronous uh, atomic transactions, you have to pay the price for it. So for me, the good thing from these, from these results is that we don't have any overhead by using the, the Rados implementation. And now, and now you're thinking, OK, oh my god, what this guy is saying is so cool. I like to try this, or how can I test it? And then the good thing is that uh, while playing with that, we also built Ansible playbooks for that. So, if you go there, you just clone it and you just vagrant up. We use the vagrant provisioning system for Ansible, and then you got one machine, well, the, almost the exact, the exact same setup that I showed you before. So one Swift proxy, one Ceph monitor, and then n storage uh, nodes. So um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Then if you want to work with real men on bare metal. Uh, you can almost find the code available on Stackforge. It's currently being under review now. Should be hopefully available next week, I don't know. But in the meantime, we, we have a repository over there for, for this. So uh, you can just play with it. It's just a couple of files, so it's not that much to set up. Now, from a, from a, a design perspective, uh, if I had to build such a platform, I would certainly go with uh, such design. Uh, so how we use usual components such as keep alive D to maintain the virtual, uh, virtual IP and then HA proxy to load balance and, and route all the requests. And then I'll collocate always Swift proxy with a self monitor, obviously. You want to start with three nodes because um, self monitors are based on Paxos. So Paxos is a consensus algorithm. So when you, want, when you speak about consensus, that, that means square room as well, and you always need an odd number for this. And well, on the storage side, you can just start with n storage uh, servers, but once again, always co-locate Swift object daemons with Ceph OSDs, because as I said, uh, since the well, uh, crush algorithm is deterministic, we had in a previous setup like um, 30 OSDs, then we more or less had one chance over 30 to have a local, a local heat, um, saying that the request goes through, well, basically, we can imagine it like this, uh, you have the client over there somewhere, and then it goes through the VIP, through this uh, HA proxy, the HA proxy uh, talks to the Swift proxy, and then the Swift proxy decides, okay, I'm gonna store the object on this Swift object server, and the object server, based on the, pool, the name of the pool, the name of the PG, and well, a lot of things from Ceph, a lot of calculations, you might get these disks, this disk storing the object. So that's, um, well, you can easily benefit from that. And yes, that, that was, well, uh, a, single, uh, a single data center. Uh, as I said before, a single location, a single replica for Swift, and n replicas for Ceph. So Ceph is handling the replication in this situation. Now if I had to build like a G replication cluster, I will basically reuse the exact same setup, but individually in each location. And I will just add some DNS magic uh, in the middle just to, to as a client, uh, write at the, the nearest possible uh, Swift proxy. So as mentioned as well before, the setup is changing a little bit here because Swift is now handling the replication. 
So you have to configure, we have three zones, three regions here. So what you do is you just set three replicas and you let Ceph on the background handling the replication. And obviously you can still take advantage of zones and affinities with Swift because everything is happening at the proxy level. Some issues that we have uh, currently, uh, um, just to be clear and don't get me wrong, this is not a problem from our implementation, but it's just more about the current state of the disk file inside Swift. Uh, Swift needs account and DBs to store metadata information about um, the objects and where they are stored. So basically, you still need to, to, to set up rsync to just replicate everything across all the nodes. Uh, there is a patch going on already uh, that is supposed to introduce a multi-backend functionality as well. So eventually we will be able to store, to store all of the objects, uh, well, not objects, sorry, but DBs and accounts within Ceph as well. So we will have the complete integration and well, everything will be stored uh, in Ceph. DevStack Ceph. Uh, have been struggling since January to get Ceph uh, into DevStack. Basically, what I had, that what I got is, uh, please refactor DevStack, and uh, you will get your patch merged because uh, DevStack is not flexible enough for now. Uh, what we want to end up with is uh, a directory when you, where you have a new driver, and then you just put the file there, and then you got your new driver. So, DevStack can't do this now. We have a session tomorrow to discuss this, and hopefully, we will end up with something pretty good uh, during the Juno cycle. In the meantime. This, uh, this works, so you can still get this patch. It will configure you Glance. With, uh, it will deploy a Ceph cluster, a local machine, of course. Uh, configure Glance with it. Cinder, Cinder backup. Uh, eventually, Nova, when we will get this merged. Uh, so, well, feel free to play with it, at least if you want to know how to configure this for uh, another cluster. The roadmap, a little bit about the roadmap. We had a fantastic session on Tuesday, a three hours long session to discuss what we would like to see. And well, to be honest, uh, back then in Hong Kong, we were a little bit um, too much optimistic about all the features that we wanted to see into ISO. So this time we tried to, um, to be a little bit more realistic in terms of the feature that we want to, uh, to, to see in, in, in Juno. So these are, more or less the commitments that we made, and uh, hopefully we will, uh, we will success. So, uh, Dimitri has an ongoing uh, work from, for the QCOW clones, so we will just continue on this and uh, maybe start something else afterwards. We, uh, Vladik will take care of using the RBD snapshots. Uh, the thing is, now when you want to snapshot a virtual machine, uh, this is kind of a disruptive uh, intervention. So, Basically, it stops the VM and then it copies the disk uh, locally and then it uploads, it uploads it again, well, stream, stream it into Glance and goes into Ceph again. Um, we want, what we want to achieve here is more or less the exact same thing as um, the copy and write cloning. So, yeah, even if it's cloned, you can snapshot it and then directly store it in Glance. So, everything is happening at the Ceph, at the Ceph layer and nothing is going up and forth uh, from Glance to Nova and so, and so on. I'll continue my work on DevStack Ceph and hopefully we'll get this done uh, before Juno. Uh, soon as I'm ready for, with this, uh, I'll try to build a CI system uh, within the gate just to, to have a Ceph job that's running and of course based on DevStack. Uh, I truly hope that thanks to this, we'll be able to get our patches merged more quickly. Um, and finally, the, uh, this is the only feature that we are missing uh, in terms of compatibility with all of the features available uh, from, from Cinder. It's the, the volume migration. So Josh will take care of, uh, of this. So the goal for us is uh, if you use the multi backend, we, we have, uh, there are two ways to implement it because there are two use cases. The one is you use the Cinder multi backend functionality and then you have multiple Ceph pools with several capabilities, and then you want to migrate from one pool to another. That's kind of the easy one. And the other one is like migrating from LVM to Ceph or Solidfire from Ceph or whatever. Uh, merci.
this is a little hint just to remind you that the next OpenStack Summit will be in Paris, and so you, you better get ready. Uh, thanks for stopping by. Uh, thanks for your kind attention, and now I'll be happy to, to take questions. So if you, if you have one question, you can go on the mic. Please, one question. <laughs> and by the way, I have my Swift backup over there, so if, uh, if I'm not able to answer any Swift question. But if I don't have any question, I would just assume that that was a really perfect presentation. So thank you very much. Oh, you have a question. No? No? No question? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of an epic fail. I was about to do a QR code, but I forgot. So you were supposed to scan this and get the presentation. Uh, the presentation will be online uh, right away after the presentation. Uh, yeah, I'll tweet. Um, look at the Innovance Twitter, and you will see the, the link uh, going. So how does one the, question? Okay. How does the um, Swift uh, gateway functionality for object compare with the native um, Rados gateway? Oh. How do you see that? What, what, what do you see the roles there? I mean, uh, uh, the thing is, um, they are like com two, two, complete, two complete separate uh, functions. Uh, the, the, when you want to store an object with Swift, you have to go through. This is a path through, so you have to go through the, the Swift proxy and then through the object server. But um, with Rados Gateway, everything happens at the proxy. Uh, at the well, let's call it the proxy as well, and it directly stores all of the objects uh, from here. So you have one on up less, uh, okay. at least. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all agreed also during the session that this should have been implemented at the Swift proxy level. So if you can just implement this at the Swift, uh, the Swift proxy level, you don't have to go through uh, all the machines or other processes, at least. Oh, OK. So you mean as far as um, just changing something within the Swift implementation and being able to get more directly into the Rados yes. layer? Yes. Okay. So each, if, if we could just directly connect the, the library mm -hmm. that endorses all of this directly at the Swift proxy level, we won't have to go through an object server and then have to, okay. to store it afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Don't see any more questions. Sorry. Thank you.